Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go over a comment that I was reading. It's a, it's a question in the comment section. It's actually a pretty good question and I'm actually anxious to answer it because it's it's kind of difficult to answer this because it's very, it's somewhat complex. I mean, not super complex, but it 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 it'll make you realize certain things about the market that you might not have realized before. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of uh, excited to to present this to you. Uh, so the question is, could you explain in another video the numerator and denominator with the background of the financial markets? Uh, I didn't understand it in your short explanation. Appreciate your videos and great job as, as always. Uh, so what I mean by the numerator and denominator, so the numerator is the top number, denominator is the bottom number. It is a ratio. And what, what I do in a short kind of explanation is uh, I, I look at the financial markets. And what I want to do is I want to set a value hierarchy. And what is what is a value hierarchy, right? A value hierarchy is looking at <clears throat> the valuation of assets compared to history. And what I'm looking for is I want to look for assets that are cheap. And what does that mean? Cheap assets means that money has either uh, not flown to it over time or has flowed away from it over time. And almost all of these, at least from what I've gathered and what I look in history, is all of these markets are cyclical. Uh, and what does that mean? So you've got large cycles that occur over time. Too much investment in this one area, not enough investment in another area. Demand goes up for this one, demand or supply goes down for another one. It's it's a way to identify the value in the market and create a hierarchy out of it. And the most highly valued stuff is the stuff that I would not be investing in. The stuff that is very low is the stuff that I'm very interested in. The way that you can make purchasing power gains, which is all relative to the numerator and denominator, if you buy something that's overvalued and it can still go up, but is but if other assets go up faster than it, you're losing purchasing power of those other assets. So what you want to identify is what are the cheap assets in the world? The question that you have to answer is how do you identify the cheap assets in the world? Uh, and what people would say, well, you look at the fundamentals. The fundamentals won't give you relative value. Everything's based off relativity. Well, deep, right? Relativity means that uh, if money comes into the system, we need to know where that money is going. We need to know where the money flows are going because money flows is what changes the value of investments. Uh, it's not the fundamentals. The fundamentals uh, are a, we'll call it like a, a, a picture or, or information on something. Uh, it's like looking at a basketball player and then reading his stats. That's kind of like the fundamentals uh, uh, of that time. They're static. They're looking backwards and it's of that time. Um, what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out, well, where's the money have, has flown? Because your opportunity uh, in the markets are not where the money has flowed. It's where the money is going to flow to. And in order to identify where the money is going to flow to, you first have to identify the value hierarchy of uh, the markets. And the only way that I know how to do that is to price asset versus asset in that numerator and denominator. But another thing that you might want to look into, and I might, I don't know if I talked about it here, is uh, whatever you price, you're pricing it in that type of format in terms of the financial markets. Uh, so when you look at it, you're going to price something in dollars, but the dollar will also have an impact on how money flows are in the system. Uh, so when you start pricing currencies against other currencies, that is your denominator. Uh, so you have a commodity priced in dollars, but let's just say the dollar is strong. What that's going to do is, is investors worldwide may want to put more money to dollar-denominated assets because the dollar is stronger or gaining strength against other assets. And what that means is you're, you're basically playing a double, uh, a, a double play here. You're playing the asset that's generating cash and the asset that's generating cash in dollars. So if you're in Brazil or you're in uh, some other country that has a weaker currency than dollars, 
the the play then becomes well i want to buy dollar denominated assets because in my currency i'm gaining uh off that investment of the dollar strength and the business making money it's it's a twofold bet now in commodities and and this is kind of just a a a a, a way to look at this we were in a period where we had uh low inflation and low interest rates what that does and a strengthening dollar. So the the market conditions. I'm looking back at the market conditions. Strong dollar, low interest rates, low inflation. What that's going to do in a declining interest rate environment is it's going to put basically people are going to put, huddle their money. They're going to put all this money and flow it all to dollar denominated assets. That's that denominator. Dollar denominated assets and then they're going to put it into like tech companies. Why tech companies? Because tech companies, uh, they get valued differently when uh, interest rates go down. They're, they're high growth, uh, the growth into the future under a very low interest rate environment where the interest rates continue to decline are going to push those valuations to the moon. And the way that you can verify that, the way that you can tell that I'm not you know, fluffing anybody, that I'm not giving you the, 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 uh, the we'll call it the reach around or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> is we can see it in the ratios. That's why stocks are so expensive in relationship to commodities. And that's what I pulled up here. Uh, the CRB index to S&P uh, 500 here, uh, that's what this ratio is. And back in the other, we'll call it the, the other commodity bull market, it reached all the way to level valuation levels of 0.025. And this has been declining over time where we eventually broke to the upside here. Uh, so what I'm describing here and what this chart is telling me is the, the the chart is telling us that the value hierarchy of all these different assets that stocks are valued richly in comparison to commodities. Now, what you can do is you can look at a whole bunch of different uh, ratios, and you can play basically an IQ game uh, or or, uh, or solving a puzzle, however you want to call it. So, if you could say that that, and I'm just going to make a super simple thing: if A is greater than B and B is less than C, then B, if we have A, B, and C, B is the cheapest of those assets, if, we were, if they're all assets. Uh, because a, a B is less than A, and B is less than C, therefore B is the cheapest. Now, if you've got a whole bunch of assets that are priced against each other, what you can do is you can say, okay, uh, I am going to look at the cheapest assets across these 50 assets. You start running that, that, that game, where you play this asset against this asset, and then you, you do it across everything. Eventually, you'll say, okay, these are the five cheapest assets. They are the ones that are cheaper than all the other ones. And then you start looking at the uh, fundamentals of those uh, of those sectors. Some of the sectors may be really bad. Some of them may be ready to turn because the underinvestment in that sector uh, has, has left it basically bare. The, the, the cupboards are bare in the inventory. The uh, supply demand balance is messed up uh, because of the underinvestment that's happened before it. And money will just cycle back and forth uh, chasing things that have low inventory levels, supply deficits, uh, whatever. It gets valued differently, like people want it more than another one uh, based off of techn technological growth and the minerals that are used in it. There's a whole bunch of different reasons. Doesn't matter really what the reasons are. What we want to identify is what's cheap. And what are the market conditions to change that so it improves? And then what you can do is you can look at the valuation of these two assets against each other, like the commodity to S&P 500, and look to see when they change against each other. Uh, so that's what, it, that's what that means. Now, looking at the current cycle and tying all of this together, like you, you're, you're, you're taking bits and pieces of information through charting, and then you just ball it all up. You make this ball out of it. And then you got to figure out what does this ball mean? What is, how's it going to change? What, what's going on? This ball of information. And what I've, you know, what I've seen is <clears throat> looking at certain periods of time, history, uh, you can tell that uh, low inflation, low inter lowering interest rates, uh, stocks thrive under those market conditions. And that's really a recovery phase in real estate is what I found if you tie it all together. Uh, what's happening is we've got multiple cycles that are aligning all at one time. Uh, I haven't. I don't know if we've really seen this 
uh, outside of the 1970s. Uh, what, what that means is we've got like a credit cycle that's aligning with a commodity cycle, a big commodity boom, and then a liquidity uh, cycle uh, on top of it with the housing uh, starts uh, and the demographics of the millennials aligning up with it as well. So we've got this, this large, uh, we'll call it alignment that's happening in the markets everywhere where the valuations of commodities are extremely dirt cheap, right? Just dirt cheap. Uh, in relationship to all the other assets. Precious metals are dirt cheap in relationship to other assets. And they've been declining in value against other um, other assets, gold um, more specifically, uh, gold against the, the money supply, gold against stocks, gold against uh, bonds and, and whatnot <clears throat> is what I'm referring to. They've been, they were declining for a very long time. And that that cycle has changed since 2000-ish. Uh, we had a little minor, we'll call it minor commodity bull market from 2000 to 2008. And I think, you know, a lot of people think that was a big one. Uh, what I think com was coming is a, is a big commodity bull market. Why would I say that? There's a lot of data that supports that this could be a very large bull market because of the alignment that I just described. And you can see it in the ratios. You can see it in the uh, money supply and how money has flowed into other sectors creating the largest imbalance in the ratios that we've seen in over 100 years. Um, we, we, had, we weren't even this cheap in the, in the beginning of the 1970s. And the 1970s had the right market conditions for money to flow into precious metals and commodities. Uh, it was a larger demographic. It was a lot of inflation. And then interest rates started to go up quite dramatically. Uh, I think those market conditions are all in place right now. And I don't know if the Fed can stop it. I don't know. Um, they're going to probably to try, you know, try to do all these tricks, but it's just going to be too much money flowing around and sloshing around, uh, moving too quickly, perhaps. That's why interest rates are going up so fast. And that was one of the reasons, or one of the things that I talked about earlier on the channel was watch interest rates. It's going to, it's going to force, uh, it's going to put pressure on the existing valuation hierarchy to change where lower valued commodity sectors and some of those sectors in, in the commodities to absolutely explode higher uh, because of the market conditions of inflation and interest rates. Those are the two. Now, there's another third one that I'm watching, and that's the value of the dollar. And it has not fallen yet. You, you hear me, every market update, the technical analysis update of gold, I always go over interest rates and dollar. The dollar has not fallen yet. And when that thing starts to fall, that's when you get the other pin to drop into alignment. We have the alignment of inflation. We have the alignment of interest rates. The next one's the dollar. Because if the dollar gets really weak, then it will re it'll it'll force that denominator to change. Uh, what happens is if if other currencies get stronger, people are like, I don't need to be in the dollar anymore. I don't want dollar assets. Get me out of here. That that might be even one of the reasons why the dollar declines, is people don't want dollar denominated assets during those time periods. So that's one thing that I'm also looking at, and that's what accelerates the commodity bull market. We are still very early in this commodity bull market, in my opinion. So when you're valuing things, you're, you're going to look at the valuation hierarchy, is what I just made up right now. <laughs> you see what's expensive, and you go all the way down, and you find these cheap assets. Then you ask yourself, well, what could make these change? What, what could make money flow into these? And what I found, you know, based off of the thesis of the channel is inter high inflation and interest rates going up. Uh, that causes a rotation of money. And what do we have right now? We've got the federal funds rate going up very slowly and we have high inflation. So I think that uh, the other thing that you want to think of is it's a commodity to it's not commodity. The uh, currencies are also being priced at certain valuations. Uh, that's one thing that a lot of people, I think, tend to forget. Uh, emerging markets is are going to do. Emerging markets will do very well when the dollar starts to decline. Uh, that's your your trigger point, so to speak. Uh, and if you look at like say EEM, uh, that's a that's a a company. I mean a an index or ETF, I should say, an index fund uh, that you can see is bottoming right here. See that big wick at the bottom there? Uh, we could be in very good valuation territory if if big if guys big if that dollar can get weaker. If the dollar doesn't get weaker, then I, it's going to be a headwind until it is. But this, this, this 
way that it's set up, you can see this large pattern. We broke out. It usually comes back and does a retest. Now we're just doing an accentuated retest is what I'm calling this. And then I think we're going to take off at some point. We, we, I mean, that's that's my take. It always has during commodity bull markets, but it's also had a weaker dollar. And you can see it, it really goes higher when it goes. And they're usually tied to commodities. But, uh, you know, keep in mind that that this stuff has a denominator. It's not just, oh, it's priced. It's $30. Well, no, your denominator is dollars. You can price it in other currencies. You can price it in other assets. You can price it in all sorts of different things. So everything we use, everything we do in this world uh, is usually priced uh, with a denominator. And remember, the denominator, the dollar, is heavily, heavily manipulated. <laughs> it's interest rates. That's a way to, to the, the, the cost of money, the, t the uh, cost of money and 50% and of all transactions, uh, at least in America, uh, is dollars. So you're trading you know, X for dollars. Well, if they control and manipulate that, that means they're controlling and manipulating 50% of every transaction, which is half of, you know, it's every transaction that's done in dollars. So I just, I just want you to be aware of that. And it's, it's important as an investor to know all these things because uh, you're trying to gain in a system uh, that is, it's hard to make actual purchasing power gains. Uh, you're going to have to beat things that are low risk that do quite well, like gold. You have to beat gold. If you, if you can't beat gold, go buy gold. I mean, it's that simple. You want to preserve wealth? Go buy gold. If you can't beat gold, then don't play the game. Just just get out of it and play, and, and play the, the gold directly, the physical gold. Uh, so when I, when, I, when I talk about my savings, do you, people ask me, do I, do I keep any cash? Do I keep any cash for a crash? My cash is physical precious metals. That is what I store my wealth in. Uh, I don't have cash. I have wealth. Like I, I store it there. Now, yeah, I, I understand that buying stocks for with gold is is going to be too difficult. So I do have cash. I do make money. I do shift things around. Uh, so I do have some, but I don't store cash. I don't st store copious amounts of cash just to have it. Uh, if uh, if an opportunity is there, I, I take it. I buy it and I take it. That that's my my viewpoint uh, and how I view things. So uh, hopefully this better. Uh, you know, get you a little bit better understanding of what I mean by the the numerator and denominator, and how things uh, are influenced based off the denominator as well, not just the numerator. Because everyone that I talk to, it, it's always a supply demand balance. Well, that's only talking about the the numerator. Uh, it doesn't talk about money flows, and the actual denominator is a larger impact than the numerator in most cases, because that is when money starts to flow big money. I'm not talking small money. I'm talking the big stuff, the bond market, the stock market, to flow over to commodities, to flow over precious metals, to flow over into real estate and other things. Uh, so just keep that in mind, guys. I just wanted to talk about that. And hopefully there's some value there uh, that you can get uh, when you think about investing. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, click, sub, you know, click subscribe. Give me a thumbs up button for the content. Uh, check out my Finding Value uh, website. Uh, I, I've actually added a ton of value, guys. We've got a Discord server that I have, have started for the website. So if you sign up, uh, you'll get access to that. Uh, I've got that. Uh, I'm, I'm doing weekly calls at the moment for Platinum members. So if that's interesting, uh, you can ask any questions you want. Uh, I, I'm recording the meeting so you can see it and view it afterwards. And I, I think there's crazy amounts of value that could be had by asking those questions because a lot of people have similar questions uh, to, to probably yours that you have. I also share a bunch of uh, stock picks for the Platinum members. Um, you can see my personal portfolio in terms of what I hold, not the amounts, but you can see what I hold. Uh, I can go over and answer questions during your, your Q&As uh, on my portfolio, on how I'm changing it, what I'm buying, uh, what I think the best opportunities in the market are at this time. Uh, I Obviously, I can, I'll share my opinion on it. It's not advice by any means, but uh, I, can, I can share my opinion. You guys can go from there on how you want to go forward with your own portfolios. So uh, thanks for listening, guys. Really appreciate it. I'll see you next time. This is Finding Value.